This time on the show, breaking out of the sandbox, Schaefer and Cueva share their research on bypassing application whitelists. Plus, what does it take to put on an IPv6 network at a HackerCon? Brett Thorson of Shmoo Labs explains. And finally, it wouldn't be a HackerCon without Johnny Long and the latest from Hackers for Charity. All that and more on this Hack5 special from ShmooCon 2012. This segment of Hack5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack5. My name's Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. It's your weekly dose technolust. Bazinga. I don't get it. <laughs> don't worry about it. I want, to pro <laughs> I want to profess my undying love to IP tables, or IP tables, or however you want to say it, because what? there's something, something that just makes me so excited when I see that TAC NAT, TAC A, post routing, TAC your subnet, and the TAC O, the interface, and the J masquerade, and everything gets happy again. I think I lost you when you said I've been doing Tech. a lot of de development work. Oh, does this have to do with yeah, the thing and the, the thing. stuff in the box? And it's all working. Oh. And it blinks, the lights blink, you turn it on, the lights hey. blink, everything is happy. Hey, and it's hey, because hey. of IP tables. Now, when yes. are we hearing uh, more? Next week. Next week. This is actually the last episode of the 10th season, so we've got to make yeah. a big deal about it. Even Woo, though it's we'll the be end back of the 10th season, next season. we'll be back next week. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Trust your time <laughs> And then next week, we get to make a big deal about it. Oh, it's the first episode, even though that's we've true. got the new set already. We got it early. Oh, that's okay. We unwrapped the new set. I like the new set. I like the we new set, We need to too. put something back there. Paul, make it right in the happier. Middle. Yeah, make it happier, Paul. Yeah, do the thing. Give us a... Oh, you want to make it we happy. Yeah, uh, want to make it happy. Uh-oh. You need this is a family show. <laughs> I want to see, like, a shadow box back here uh -huh. with... Uh, a lot of cool stuff that we've got from fans. Mm. I thought that would be really cool. We could actually put an entire trinket wall up we of could. stuff that we've got from fans. It would be a fans. museum of retro computer parts. Uh, uh, or e-cycling <laughs> in or some e cases. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's see what e-cycling would get. No, let's play the, uh, w w what's the game that we call Send it? Send it to Gazelle. What's in the box? Yeah. <laughs> All right, what you do we get play? this week? Yeah, let's play. So um, you're going to open this one. All right. Because I'm pretty sure it's a gift from me. Oh. Huh. Wait, it's a gift from you? You it's sent for you. me. Oh, for you. Yeah, it's from the Netherlands. It is yeah. from. Do we want to say? Do we want the Nether regions? <laughs> from Shannon's Nether regions comes. What's wrong with you? A, I think it's from Evan. Is this a decoder ring? Oh, here. <gasps> I know what this is. Give me here. No, that's not the part I want. That's not the part I want. The card. That's the part I want. There it is. That's the part I want. This is so cool. I know what this is. I saw these. Tog when I was then in all snubs. Tog then? Hmm. Have fun with it. Love. Yaffle. Thank you. Ah! ah. Ciao. Ah. You just <laughs> chow chowed me. Yeah, it says ciao. You chowed me ciao. twice. Ciao is um, you chowed me hello like... and goodbye in Italian, I believe. <sighs> chowed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is awesome. At least so it wasn't what did candy. the rest of it say? Tag them all, snubs. Have fun with it. Love, Yaffle. Yaffle. I get it now. Yaffle. I'm slow today. Actually, if you want to put me in, in bash, then like I'm in my happy Ooh, place, I and think. then we can all talk Yay. about persistent no fails with 46800 no off default routes. What? Yeah, user S or USR has been. Is this one another hello. another one of those talks yeah, that I missed at ShmooCon no, while I was working? No, no, no. Maybe I'll give a talk on it. Ooh, that'd be really Actually, cool. I'm giving a talk Send on it at South papers. by Southwest. Are you officially? Yeah, yeah. Sweet. I'm on the uh, the, the 10th, awesome. March 10th. Oh, be there. Cool. South by Southwest will barbecue. Uh, Epic. That's going to be cool. Yes. I'm excited to see that. Uh, we have awesome stuff here from ShmooCon. This is our part two of our uh, ShmooCon conference that we go to every year and have an a awesome blast at. And we're sorry if we didn't see you there, but we will see you at TorCon, DefCon, DerbyCon, Yadacon, Nauticon. Yummy con. Enemy Expo. Not that one. Anyway, we're right now going to tease you about how Shmoocon Labs and Johnny Long are coming up at the end of the show. But right now, we're going to throw it over to Schaefer and Cuevas to talk about application wireless security. So what was wrong with traditional antiviruses where we're just like, oh, this is bad. Stop it. I like to think about it like this, the spam thing that was going on. So when you're thinking about spam before, we were running these blacklists and they were just getting unruly, right? So they're getting so big because they're just jumping servers, changing systems, changing email addresses, changing domains. 
So people started doing whitelisting with email, just saying, you know, I only want these people to be able to send me the messages. I think it's the same thing with the executables. Uh, we're just chasing our tails. We can change payloads on the fly, polymorphic stuff, you know, with MSF encode or whatever you want to do. Uh, so that's not going to work. There has to be something better. So whitelisting is going to be the only way. So is this like a trend for the uh, the industry? Is this is this direction that we're going to see more and more with AV vendors? Uh, I definitely think it's going to be the trend with the industry. Uh, I think it is the right direction. Uh, the the antivirus just isn't working. Uh, it's good for detecting things almost after the fact. Uh, this is a more proactive approach, I feel. So I do think it is the future. Again, uh, it's the marketing guys kind of selling it more as the silver bullet. So there's a couple of different vendors out here with a couple of different suites for application whitelisting. Uh, what does that mean for the end user? What does it mean for the administrator on the actual client? With the application whitelisting, the pieces of software will, will set up a whitelist of, hey, these are the 10 things you can execute. Uh, by default, a lot of these, uh, you have options. You can just say, hey, these are the executables. You can do by check some of the executables if you really, really want to get into it uh, in a more in-depth level. You can approve certain paths where you can run applications from. So we can run anything in System 32. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They tend not to do that. AppLocker was the only one that, that thought the path thing was a really yeah, great know. way to go. No. Uh, yeah, no, that, fail. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then you can also do it by signed software, and you can approve certain digitally signed software, like, hey, if it's from Microsoft, let it run. Okay. Uh, so for the end user and from the management perspective, you set up a, a, a client on a desktop machine, or, well, any machine, actually, uh, and then those will only be the applications you can run. So what's wrong with that model? I mean, it sounds pretty good. If I can just say, okay, uh, the only thing I want to execute on my machine is Explorer.exe, Chrome, XChat2, you know, the other four programs I use. The thing is, is that because you need those programs, there's an inherent trust. So for example, the browser, you know, we can use JavaScript to execute things on local systems. So and it, you're going to need the browser. You're going to have to use these things. Another thing that we found, like Microsoft Office applications, for example, you know, using VBA that's already built in functionality of Microsoft Word. Oh my God, are we going down the path of a, of a Microsoft macro virus? <laughs> <laughs> could be. But yeah, but, but it yeah, be. I totally see be. what you mean because it has that functionality in it and if you trust Word, then you trust anything that Word's going to execute. Absolutely. And like Chris did a lot of work on the PowerShell stuff, you know, admins are going to use PowerShell more and more to manage these systems. So it's going to be there. There's going to be an inherent trust for it to execute. Okay, so what is it exactly about the industry that annoyed you with this that made you want to target application whitelisting? Uh, marketing. Plain and simple. They're selling this as a silver bullet. And it's just like back when Oracle said, hey, we're unbreakable. And then they said, oh, well, here's 20 zero days on you. Like, yeah, no, nothing's unbreakable. You should never advertise it like that. You should just say, this is the best solution. I'd so be this much is just another good layer for your arsenal. Yes. I again. Do you think we this is the direction that we should be going? Yes. I, I do believe this is the right direction. Our talk, our goal was not to just shit on the vendors. Well, know, what we, vendors are we talking about here? Uh, there were three vendors that we happened to look at, and this was really just due to time constraints, and these were the things that we could get access to. So we looked at uh, Bit Nine's uh, Parity's Bit Nine, uh, Microsoft App Locker, and McAfee Application Control. And what did you find? Uh, what were the, the weaknesses of those? Let's start with, I don't know, what was your favorite? <laughs> uh, my favorite ended up being Bit9, just because I was in a defensive role when I started looking at it, but I also had an offensive twist. So, you know, the vendors are coming in saying, These, this is the silver bullet to fix the problems that you're dealing with. And I just said, there's no silver bullet. It's got to make the try. So that's one of the ones that we wanted. I wanted to look at personally. Um, I also wanted to look at Microsoft's because it's built in. I think a lot of people are going to use it mm -hmm. because it's free. There's no additional yep. cost on top of what you already purchased. And I think McAfee is a good choice because a lot of governments use it and a lot of companies use it and just because of the EPO model that they have and the ability to just tie it in with the rest of their pieces. So those, that's why we chose those three. So where were the vulnerabilities? I'll start with the vulnerability that I found actually was uh, the, the biggest one was in Bit9 Parity Service. So when it notifies you that it's blocking something, it starts something called notifier.exe. 
just pop. That's just like the pop-up message box. That's just the pop-up box that says you can't do what you just tried to do. All right. So when that came up, I realized well, I had already been trying to inject into the parity service. So you're just trying to put your code at the end of some other code and make some shit happen. Yeah, yeah. So I was just fuzzing it around like that, and I said, well, what's this notifier.exe? Let me try that. And when I tried it, bingo, I was able to execute a interpreter shell back through their service, and it had an inherent trust of parity, which is the highest trust on the box. So, so to, out of all of the things that it whitelists, the only thing it doesn't check is itself. That's true. And the funny thing is, is that when you know I was doing the research about, I think it was in November of 2010, somebody found the same vulnerability with the same product, but only they were able to inject into the parity.exe service. So they've already fixed this issue once, oh, and it's just what's well, old is new again. And it just wow. it came back again. That's that's a real bummer. I'm sure those vendors aren't too pleased. But you know, this is how we get to a more secure state. So you know, again, thank you for this research because it just makes computing more secure as a whole. Um, what were the other vendors like? Uh, AppLocker is actually a complete disaster. That's the Microsoft. Uh, that's one. the Microsoft. That's one. funny to hear that because normally their software is really good. Uh, and you know what? Uh, not to dig on Microsoft, their their products over the years they've really started to take security seriously. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, well, you're right. The latest batch is so much better than NT4. Yeah, no, they're <laughs> you're killing me, man. Uh, well, you were saying, like, you know, yes, historically, yeah, historically over the last 20 years, it's gotten better. It's gotten and much that's better, something. And that's something. Uh, but obviously, the programmers were smoking crack one day and said, you know what, we should include this cool function called load library exec. And we'll give it this argument you can pass that says, we'll just ignore the code authorization level. And so if there's SRP. Break that down for me. How does that work? What is that? Is it PowerShell? Uh, or is this that is the, actually, the bit lock? This one was in AppLocker. Uh, originally, it was, I believe, DDA Stevens did a bunch of research on this. And he was able to inject shell code into VB as a macro within an Office document. Uh, and then he discovered this function. It's built in that basically, and there were actually two different arguments. There's like a sandbox argument, and then an ignore the authorization code level. And it says right in Microsoft's documentation, this will bypass app blocker, software restriction policies, and group policy. Oh my. And it's like those installers that tell you to turn off your antivirus before you install. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, and Microsoft has released a hot fix for this, not a patch. So you have to know to go and get this. Okay, but you know that that will lead to a patch. It will again make Thank things you, better. Microsoft. Good, good. Yeah. Well, hey, you know it serves. It it really pays to read that documentation because sometimes they spell it out right there in the spec. You know, here's the hole, hackers, this way. So what was the other uh, vendor? Uh, the, the McAfee product, right? Uh, the Map McAfee product, the application control. Yeah. Uh, or Solidifier, I believe is what it called. Uh, that one was interesting. Because uh, we, we turned on the memory protection in that one, and we're still able to dump shell code. So the other memory. ones don't care about memory at all. No, uh, Bit9 Parity does memory protection as well. We did not have a current enough version to here. I'll let Kirk speak to that one. Uh, Bit9 does have memory protection. The version we tested was 6.0.0. Uh, we couldn't get. I think the latest that's out is 6.0.2 which totally has full memory protection capabilities. So um, does that mean that the Notifier EXE thing wouldn't work? No, that doesn't. I mean, that, is, that was a patch that we released on a, or a workaround for it, sure. is that you can turn on memory protection for Notifier.exe. Um, but the version that we ran was 6.0.0, which memory protection isn't supported, but it's there. Gotcha. So you can turn it on. It's just not in the interface. You just have to call the PHP directly. Um, but I think we had trouble with the vendor. They wouldn't give us a trial after I left the place where I was at. Um, they basically, at that point, didn't want to help. So they said that they wouldn't give us a 30-day trial. But they offered to fly me to Boston to show them the problem. And I said, I don't know how that's cheaper than a 30-day trial. But, um, so we didn't have, we weren't able to taste, test the latest, greatest version. But I can tell you from when I was where I was, using the latest version that was out at that time, this, all this stuff's the same. It, it's all working still. Cool. So what kind of uh, vectors did you guys use to demonstrate these sorts of attacks? Uh, I mean, I guess the end, and and also to that, what is the end goal in this? Just like executing your, you know, interpreter payload or, or what? My end goal, I'm a pen tester. I want shell. Yeah. I get a interpreter shell. Life is good. I've won. Mm -hmm. uh, we came up with a number of vectors. Basically, we got it down to if I can call command.exe and PowerShell is on the machine, which by default on Windows 7, 2008, it's there. I can pop an interpreter shell. Uh, so everything from Windows help files 
to Firefox extensions to the lovely Hack 5 USB rubber ducky, which Thank is you. what I use for my demo. Awesome. And the demo gods smiled. All three went off flawlessly. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Well, I'm glad that they uh, they were they were happy with you your work. Um, and, and so, how do you go about that? Like you say, PowerShell. Like like you just it. Don't they just like you know not whitelist PowerShell? Uh, actually, by default, most of these uh, software restrictions don't allow you to execute PowerShell scripts. There's a couple interesting things. Uh, within PowerShell, you can do get content a PowerShell script and pipe that into PowerShell, and it executes it line by line. So yeah, you can't execute the script, but you can. <laughs> OK. All right. Uh, then the other thing that, that we found that was interesting, uh, and again, other people smarter than I figured this out. I was just able to leverage this was that PowerShell is tied into .NET framework. You can import a function from a running DLL, and you have access to uh, open a page in memory as read, write, execute, pump shell code in, and spawn off a new. So if you can just add it to an existing DLL that's already whitelisted, then you know Bob's your uncle. Yeah. Like kernel 32. All right. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> nice. Well, this is fascinating. Where can people find uh, your research and uh, start mucking with this more? Uh, I'm going to try and follow up with a blog post. I have a couple of reports to write. But as soon as I finish that, uh, there will be links to that on the Secure Ideas website, uh, the Secure Ideas blog. Uh, so if you go to secureideas.net, uh, you'll find links to all that. And as soon as I can publish the material, I will. And the same thing, I got some things going on, but uh, foregroundsecurity.com. You go there, we have a link to our blog right there. I'll put a blog post up. I think I wanted to add a lot more detail of the things we tried that didn't work. Yeah. We kind of wanted to focus on what did work. Oh, but we want to let, let people know like what we went through, because we tried a lot of different things. So we want to make sure that everybody's aware of everything we tried. Cool. Well, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. It doesn't matter whether you're in the shower or hanging out with friends or showering with your friends. When a killer idea hits you, you need to snag your domain fast. And with domain.com simple search and checkout process, you're gonna have that domain in like no time. Plus, when you're ready to take the next step, domain.com has rock solid hosting infrastructure to create a perfect foundation for your project. And get this, the guys over at domain.com, they're huge Hack5 fans. They wanna hook you up, so they've got a coupon code just for us. It's HAK5 at checkout gets you 15% off. So when you think domains, think domain.com.